Hello there, not coming to you from the bunker, but from an undisclosed location somewhere on the Croatian coast. This is episode 24 of Watchtower in Focus, the show that zooms in on all things JW, bringing the Watchtower and its teachings and policies under microscopic scrutiny. A former Jehovah's Witness elder and circuit overseer from Arkansas was recently taken into custody and is scheduled to stand trial in July after his arrest on four counts of second degree felony sexual assault. The charges against Roderick G. Watkins stem from allegations of sexual assault of at least four minor victims. Here to help explore the details of this shocking story is my colleague, Covert Fade, who joins me in person for the first time. Hello, Hello. Covert. Hello. And I am also joined by my other regular co-host, otherwise known as John Redwood, Mark O'Donnell, and we are joined by a friend of the show, Martin Hawk. Mark and Martin, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lloyd. Great to be here. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Martin. I know that you've taken time off work to be with us, and I, I really do appreciate that. So this is it's one of those stories that just makes your blood boil the more you go into the details. And this is why um, Covert and I, we were on holiday, but we've, we've kind of decided that this is important enough to take an evening out of our holiday and go over the details of this case. Mark, I know you have written, and we've, you've only just posted, in fact, um, a detailed article on JW Survey. Can you run us through uh, the details of this case? Yeah, thanks, Lloyd. Um, so what actually happened was uh, in November of 2018, a man by the name of Roderick G. Watkins um, was uh, arrested after the police in Heber Springs, Arkansas had conducted an investigation after receiving multiple reports from individuals from the Heber Springs area uh, that he had sexually molested not one, not two, but at least four children that we know of ranging in ages from six years of age, at least the earliest that we know of is six years young, all the way up to 16 years of age. And um, as a result, uh, a arrest warrant was placed on Roderick Watkins and also a search warrant for his home. And uh, so the police went and raided his home. Uh, they arrested w uh, Watkins. Um, he did post bail on $100,000 um, bail. And uh, so he is out. Uh, at this time under some pretty severe bail restrictions. Um, still obviously in the state of Arkansas right now. And um, it, there were some initial reports that uh, he was an extremely well-respected elder to the point where uh, some had said that he was a circuit overseer, but the later investigation proved that he was actually a service overseer and uh, not a circuit overseer unless we can find evidence to the contrary. Uh, but we have solid evidence that he served as an elder in multiple congregations, uh, beginning with um, a stint in Bethel in uh, headquarters. And maybe we can go into this in a little bit more detail. But he originally hailed from North Carolina, uh, wound up in Bethel in the late 1980s and early 90s, um, got married and immediately left to go to uh, Sedonia Springs, I believe, uh, Missouri and stayed there for quite a while, then left for Indiana and served in multiple congregations in Indiana. And then finally wound up uh, in Arkansas where we believe his wife's family is from sometime after the year 2000. And uh, it was then that the reports of abuse started coming in, uh, not immediately, but later as he settled into the congregations there and finally that led to the arrest. Now this man is uh, 56 years of age. 
And uh, he, as I said, served as the service overseer most recently in his congregation, although uh, after multiple reports of the abuse came forward, uh, the elders finally had to do something about it. Initially, after several reports, they had just taken away some of his responsibilities and he retained his role as an elder. Um, then later, as more reports came in, uh, he was disfellowshipped and we understand that took place in 2017. So that means there would be an S-77 disfellowshipping form created for him. And um, after that, at some point, the police began to investigate. So you're saying that, that measures were taken so you're saying that measures were taken by the congregation, but that right. those measures were, at least to begin with, simply stripping him of responsibility. So that would imply that he was reproved. So, yeah, now I, I can't tell you whether or not he was officially reproved. Um, right. what, I can, what I can tell you is that um, according to uh, witnesses, and when I say witnesses, people that are uh, familiar with the congregation, um, are aware that he had some of his responsibilities revoked. And um, initially that meant that he was still serving as an elder. So he was not initially reproved. He just had uh, certain responsibilities revoked um, while they continued to monitor him. So he still had full access to the congregation and the children. We do not have any evidence of whether the police ever uh, were contacted by the elders. In fact, uh, I mentioned that in the JW survey article that the evidence would appear to the contrary, and we can get into that a little bit later with the Arkansas law, and the reason why those elders uh, likely did not report the abuse. And if you read the police report, which we've included the redacted version of the police report in the survey article, uh, it's very clear that it was the parents of these children, ultimately, especially the three minor children who just came forward um, in the past year, to actually speak to the police. And they were the ones who volunteered to come in and speak to uh, the uh, Officer Osborne, who was the one who collected all of this information and ultimately went to the judge and the judge issued the arrest warrant. And um, uh, we've got a mugshot uh, directly from the uh, Heber County Detention Center, uh, right on the front of our Are we web. able to show that on the screen now? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me see if we can pull that up and we'll do a screen share on that. Um, <laughs> we've actually got a, a few images that we can share uh, so the mug shots are small and somewhat grainy. So uh, let me see if it's possible to do that for our audience here. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right. And while, while just while you're doing that, um, Martin. So so hit, these are the mug shots now. Martin, you have served as an elder. Um, and, and you've witnessed the process of what goes on in a congregation when a body of elders is aware of pedophilia. Um, having viewed some of the details of this story, how does this, how do you reconcile what's happening here with your own experience? Well, I would like to go back to 1988. So 1988, I was in Ohio uh, staying with my grandparents. My grandfather was a ministerial servant. He was not an elder. And um, my brother and I were in the basement playing, and I might have told you the story before a year ago. We came upstairs and we saw my grandfather molest our cousin. So we, we waited to, for two weeks until my parents came and picked us up. We told them, well, instead of calling the police, my parents went back to Ohio from Pennsylvania and a judicial meeting was formed. Now there was three witnesses to this case, my cousin, my brother, myself, and a judicial committee was formed, but it was one of the old arrangements were my grandfather was on the left of the Kingdom Hall, and my brother and I were on the right, my mom was there, and my cousin, her mom, were there. So the three elders did not disfellowship him, and they did temporarily remove his, his privileges, but they didn't even delete him as a ministerial servant. So nothing became of that, that, that case, even though it was a farce of a case. So I could easily see them doing that. And another case in my congregation, this was not about pedophilia, but our coordinator came forward about a pornography when I was an elder and uh, 
we had several meetings with him and we took all his privileges away for like six months, but we didn't delete him as an elder. And then he stepped down as coordinator, but he still was an elder. And so the, we've seen these multiple times. And the other case, I can't mention his name, but uh, the branch actually labeled him a predator because he actually kidnapped his minor sister, took her across state lines and raped her. So we, we did not let him have any talk privileges or you know, uh, auxiliary pioneer privileges, but we had to wait until the actual branch would come back to us. But he was allowed to, to comment until the branch said, no, he, he can't do anything. Again, he was not disfellowship because he was repentant. So I can easily see the congregation following suit in Arkansas because I've seen in multiple different occasions the same, a similar situation is not exactly the same. Sure. Uh, you, you've studied stories like this, Covert, and I know you've been going over the details of this case. Um, it, it's pretty shocking, isn't it? It is. And what's what's kind of sad about this is it conforms to a pattern and the sad effect is now we have a pattern because we have seen so many of these cases um and really we have as we know as we're going to see the two witness rule will come up here um and this is yet another example of the two witness rule um if we read through it it seems clear to me that the application of this rule has resulted in there being more victims than there had to be or at least potentially this could have been avoided and you think to yourself, how many more cases, how many more failure scenarios do we need for the two witness rule before Watchtower realizes that this rule is, is allowing there to be more victims? The other thing that strikes me interesting, and I wanted to drill down on this, is, um, and again, this, this, is, this is a point raising on the fact that his privilege was suspended. The, for, for the third victim, victim three, um, the mother goes on to report that they were told by the church elders that Watkins had done it unintentionally. So in other words, the elders didn't believe he meant to do what he did. It was like a slip or an accident. But they still removed his suspension of duties. So that I, I find that puzzling because either you think someone did it literally like slipped, oh, no big deal, or you think someone did something wrong and therefore you take their duties away. This weird middle ground of saying, oh, they're telling the mother we don't think it was intentional, but they still remove some of his duties. How do you unintentionally rape a child? This is well, What he's accused of doing is... Um, inappropriate fondling when he was on his lap. But now if you read the details of what he did, I don't see how that could be unintentional. It, it, it seems like a real slip. So that's the first question mark that is over that. But then even if I give the elders the benefit of the doubt that they think it was unintentional, the fact that they then remove some of his duties suggests to me that they don't think it was unintentional. And you almost get the impression that they're like, they're trying to slap his wrist, but also fudge it so that it appears to the congregation that's, that's my reading of it. Now, I could be wrong, but that's one of the many things that strikes me about this. Of, it seems to me that I mean, this event took place uh, approximately nine to ten years ago. And it seems clear to me that the, the start of the elders being aware that something was wrong was at least nine to ten years ago. Um, and this is the case in so many JW um, child sexual assault cases. If people had just contacted the police when the first suspicion had come up, this thing, could, this predator could have been in bars years ago. Um, and this is that we see this in all these cases that like if the, if the elders had just contacted the police, you wouldn't have had to go through all these multiple victims and multiple years before finally people, you know, the police. Um, so I think this is going to be suddenly yet another example of Watchtower's policies. They don't protect the congregation. They're endangering the congregation. Um, and these policies endanger the children of Jehovah's Witnesses rather than protecting them so they're just not fit for purpose indeed yeah. and i know um mark you've really been doing some digging on this and, and congratulations on a superb article that you've put together on this um how do you think that this story highlights the actual policy issues that that we are trying to highlight on this show when it comes to watchtower's approach to child sex abuse well, I think it goes hand in hand with uh, what Covert was just saying about the number of reports and, and how much it took to get to the point where he, they would actually take judicial action and disfellowship him. And, and bear in mind that when a person like this is disfellowshipped, the congregation still does not know the reason. The only way that they know would be um, A, if word of mouth from other congregate members, which we do believe happened in this case, um, and number two, if uh, 
Watchtower advises the elders to go ahead and advise those with children that there is a, a known pedophile in their midst. Um, but that's a very rare occasion, even though that is a policy that they have implemented in the past few years, where they have said, if a person is a known child molester, the elders may choose to inform parents that have small children. But as we know, uh, this is not you know, a police state. This is, you know, this is a, a loosely put together congregation that has members coming and going all the time. There's a million loopholes to where someone who is visiting for the day or going out in field service um, doesn't have any idea that this man is a known pedophile. And, you know, sadly, uh, you know, it can happen in other organizations and religions too. What we're highlighting is the fact that it is so damaging to have these policies where it takes so much to harness or rein in an individual who's a known pedophile that they can get away with it. And as Covert pointed out, they can get away with it to the point where multiple additional victims are harmed before any action is ever taken. So I point out in the article an example of this where you know, the third victim uh, comes forward um, and is discussed in this case. And um, I'm looking at the notes from the article here. Uh, this, this is reference to, I believe it was the young girl that had been sitting on his lap and um, she had been sexually molested underneath of a blanket and he was doing this. Um, and by the way, some of this occurs in, in full view of other people. It could happen at the Kingdom Hall. It could happen at a field service meeting where, you know, this guy was so brazen that he would put a child on his lap under a blanket and do this to the child. And these children are not making these stories up that they were sexually molested or fondled. And, you know, individuals like this will take every opportunity, especially once they've offended. The, the recidivism rate is extremely high for child sexual offenders which is why this is so critical. So what he did was he obviously molested this one young girl and did it to another young boy. But when you put these cases together and then you realize that victim number four mentioned in the story was the oldest victim and the one who came forth first, that means that there was at least one person who, victim number four, who came forth first to the elders some time ago when it happened to him years ago and he wasn't believed. And then it, another report came to the elders and still nothing was done. And from, from reading the police report, we know that at least three came forward, at least three before he was disfellowshipped. And it's just unconscionable to think that it takes that many just to sanction this man congregationally not to mention the fact that the police were never contacted that we know of. And that's evidenced by the police report itself because they're obviously just finding this out in the year 2018. If the police had been contacted, obviously there would have been some investigation. And of course, allegedly you could say that, well, maybe if they investigated one case and they didn't have enough evidence to arrest, they were simply keeping an eye on this guy. Um, but that's not really the evidence that we have. The evidence we have shows that individual congregation members, parents, were the ones who ultimately approached the police and gave their reports. And then the police had a string of people coming one after another. And they all said the same thing. Um, the, uh, I can read you what the officer says. Officer Osborne says, as the investigation progressed, several people called in and came by the office and gave statements about seeing Watkins touch the above mentioned victims, plural victims, inappropriately. So here you have additional people, not the parents, but additional people in the congregation or in the immediate vicinity telling the police they saw him touch these victims inappropriately. It goes on to say, many of them tell how Watkins is a very affectionate, touchy person towards children they all agree that Watkins had a large influence and authority over this congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. And this is, by the way, where he served as the service overseer. And 
that is of significance because, as I think we all know, the service overseer is one of the three elders who comprise the service committee. Those are the elders most responsible for the functioning of the congregation. They receive the correspondence uh, from the branch or set up the judicial committees involving all sorts of wrongdoing. So it's my contention that this man used his authority, not only as an elder, but as a service overseer to control the narrative or the information that was being fed to the service committee. And it's very likely that he blocked these reports of abuse um, and perhaps even blocked information that came from previous congregations. I've had a number of people reach out to me from outside of the area that knew him from multiple other states, including Indiana and from Missouri. And what we do know is, first of all, we don't have evidence yet that there are victims in those other states. We're still, this is all new and it's developing. And we encourage those people that may have a story to tell to contact the authorities if they know anything. But if there are other allegations, they would have been likely sent by letter from those congregations to the Heber Springs congregation, indicating to those elders that there's a problem or allegations of child sexual abuse against this man. And we do know that at least one person or more has come forward and said that there were some allegations in the other congregation north of Heber Springs, I believe it's the Mountain View congregation. And I can mention this because this is not part of the police investigation. It's an independent source uh, that knew of the situation that he had been allegedly involved in some sort of abuse in the Mountain View congregation north of Heber Springs, but nothing was done of it. And they specifically mentioned the two witness rule as being the reason why they never took congregational action. So then he transfers to Heber Springs. He's still an elder. He becomes the service overseer. And we have four more victims of his abuse. So I, it's, it's just horrible what happened. What really hits me about this, Mark, and I don't know what you think about this, um, COVID, because we've been covering stories like this for a long time now. And it just hits me that a lot of the stories that we deal with on Watch Time Focus and have dealt with on JW Survey have been things that happened decades ago and we're only learning about it decades later because a victim has, is in a position where they can speak out about it. I'm, reading, I'm looking at your article here, Mark, and I'm seeing... Um, victims who are still teenagers. So this is happening very recently, as in within the last few weeks. So would I be right in saying that this is the most, I, I don't know whether smoking gun is the right term, but is, is this the most recent kind of story of this nature that we've encountered? Well, here's what I can tell you. We, we know that three of the victims that, that we're aware of are still minors which is obviously one reason among many reasons not to mention their names, even though they are in the police report. In fact, I'm surprised that they're included in the police report and not redacted. Mm. But they were absolutely minors at the time. It occurred from, let's say, the age of six. So, so this abuse was, has been going on, yes, for decades, for at least 10 or 15 years. We know that uh, Watkins, Roderick Watkins moved to Heber Springs after the year 2000. So he's been in that city or that part of Arkansas for close to 19 years. We know that the abuse started shortly thereafter because some of the victims were abused at age six and those victims are now twice that age um, or more. Mm. We know that one of the victims is an adult now and that abuse occurred some years ago and that victim number four went ahead he was the first person to report it to the authorities so um i cannot say i'd have to go back into the notes in fact our readers i'm sure are very sharp they can just go back into the police report and see maybe what the most recent case of it was but we're we are talking about abuse that occurred up until the past few years um and one reason we know that is that 
he was disfellowshipped in 2017, and these are following al allegations that he abused these children within a recent proximity of time to those to the disfellowshipping. I, I'm struggling to think of a more recent yeah. story than this in terms of how how recently the actual abuse happened. I don't know what you. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, we've got victim one is 12 years old in October the 9th, 2018. Um, and reading through it, um, it does appear that this is recent within the last two, two or three or four years. Mm. So this is, I mean, given the fact that most of the, most of it, they say on average, I can't remember, I'm not going to quote the exact statistic because I can't remember where I read it, but it was in one of the news reports related to the Royal Commission. And they were talking on average how long it takes a victim of abuse to come forwards. And it's something like 20 to 30 years. I'm, I'm, I don't quote me on that, look it up because I can't even, but it was something like it takes at least a decade for people to come forward. So we are seeing the fact that the, the victim one appears to be only in the last few years, that probably is the most recent that we have. And one of the reasons it strikes me significant is one of the arguments Watchtower sometimes makes is that we've changed the policies. Well, if you look at the only major change that really happened was since 2015, and if you look at the details, they haven't really changed anything. They've tweaked, they've tweaked a few things like a victim is no longer required to confront the abuser in person. But all the stuff that really matters, critically including the two witness rule, and critically including the fact that if the abuser is an elder, very frequently they end up getting investigated by their mates, the other elders, and not by an impartial authority. That's still happening. Um, and so these are the kind of the, the, the critical failure points in Watchtower's child abuse policy are still there. And this is our, the fact that the victim won and everything that's going on is still happening only a few years ago shows that well, I don't think we're we're going to see a sudden drop off in these cases, mm. put it that way. No. Um, this is probably the latest one we know about, but yeah, we're going to have a lot more coming, unfortunately. And Martin, um, you have the, the, uh, the very unique experience of having been a, a parent of a child sex abuse victim who for a substantial period of time was convinced that the way to resolving or, or pursuing some kind of justice for what happened to your daughter was through the elder arrangement rather than through um, the justice, through, through the police. And what it strikes me that what we see here is uh, a failure on Watchtower's part because this man was able to accumulate victims when it could have been uh, ended quickly but the, the the good news side of it for me is that these parents actually contacted the police um do you think that it's possible that the may 2019 article that basically told parents that they get to contact the police do you think that might have played a part in this it could be because you know the elders did talk to us in 2005 and said you know it is your right to call talk to the police but Think of the congregation. Think of Jehovah's name before you do that. But the scary thing is, I want to digress just a little bit what Covert just brought up. The scary thing about this situation is when an elder is the, the, the abuser, because an elder can block information. I don't know how the JW.org is run now, but three years ago, every congregation has two users who have access to everything. Usually it's a coordinator and the secretary. Um, our, core, our secretary was really old, was not computer literate. So I was a service overseer, so I was a second authorized user. So that means the coordinator I got all the, all the letters. So the average um, elders didn't get all the letters. They only got the, the normal elder letters. So there can be correspondence about appointments, deletions, uh, disfellowship, uh, circuitor correspondence that the average elder would not get in their inbox, but there's the secretary, the coordinator, or the service overseer. So if this man's a service overseer, he could actually block information getting to the other elders unless the coordinator, he could actually delete it before the coordinator could see it. And again, they could update it. I haven't been an elder for three years, but I resigned in February of 2016. I was checking. I still had access to the website till April. They didn't, it took them two months to remove me from access. Back in the day before we had online access, I've heard stories from my father when he was an elder. If two congregations shared the same kingdom hall, sometimes the, all the mail came to the secretary's house. It didn't even go to the kingdom hall. 
And I've heard my dad saying that elders were fighting because certain elders weren't giving the letters to the other elders. They were actually holding information. So even though JW or all the elders had more access than they do, but they really don't. So easily this person could have blocked access to uh, letters of re recommendation, letters of introductions, and all these other things. So that's what really concerns me because I, I, I can easily see that happening. Yeah, Martin, I, I wanted to thank you for bringing that point up. I, I tried to make that point in the article, and, and you really expanded on it very well in explaining that. Um, one of the things that shocked me when I first started investigating this case uh, was that uh, the bail document, and I, I have a copy of it here, and it's available on JW Survey as well. So this is a bail bond document, which uh, is a $100,000 bail that uh, Roderick uh, Watkins has signed up for in order to get out of jail uh, pending his trial. And uh, he listed his address on here, which was 1310 North Broadway in Heber Springs, Arkansas. And I, I, I mentioned that because he's not residing at that location at this time. And uh, so there's no danger to anyone there. But what was shocking to me was the fact that when I put this address into Google search to see what that address looked like, guess what popped up? The Kingdom Hall. And, uh, and, I, and I showed it to my wife, Kimmy, and I said, wait a minute, something's not right here, because here's an address for this individual. Now, as far as I know, I, he didn't live at the Kingdom Hall, and it doesn't look like the Kingdom Hall has an apartment on it. Mm -hmm. So what we think happened there was that he was the service overseer, and at some point he may have also been the coordinator um, or the, uh, the coordinator or the secretary. We, we don't know. We know for a fact that he was a pioneer, an elder, and as a pioneer, most pioneer elders will hold that position of service overseer unless there's two of them, correct? Yeah. Yep. So, so because he's service overseer, as you mentioned, he had the ability to possibly block documents to other elders, and his address may have been listed in connection with this Kingdom Hall's address. So when you pull up the bail, bail address for this man, immediately it showed me a picture of the Kingdom Hall. And I circled around, I said, well, is there an apartment building? Does he live next door? Well, it turns out he does live uh, half a block away and I can show that if, if we wanna see it, but um, he, he literally lived in walking distance. He could open his window and throw a stone to the Kingdom Hall address. But we think the coincidence is not just that he lived a block, half a block away from the Kingdom Hall, but it was the fact that his name and address may likely have been on correspondence that also said Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall and Google's algorithms, they know that sort of thing. And we've seen cases where presiding overseers or coordinators, um, their address or their house will pop up when you type in Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. So, so after, after my uh, daughter's uh, father, abuser's father moved to Delaware from Pennsylvania. He actually bought land in Delaware and donated to the Kingdom Hall to build a Kingdom Hall. So if you search his address, now I didn't know this, he's my uncle, but I haven't talked to him in over three years. I have no desire to talk to him. So the reporter who was investigating my daughter's case, she said, he lives right next to the Kingdom Hall. Did you know that? So I pulled it up on Google search and there's two driveways, his driveways off the Kingdom Hall's driveway. So did he donate that land and buy that for the Kingdom Hall to be reappointed an elder down the road? Was he trying to do, get some favor? I just think it's very odd. And this has not happened, this case or other cases, it happens several times that I know of. Yeah, well, from, from what I understand, the uh, location where he lived, he was sort of a, a handyman. He was a painter. He, uh, it was a retirement community. And uh, from investigating the retirement community where he was sort of like a caretaker and he worked or lived in this small complex of homes. Um, in fact, maybe I could just pull that, I'll pull that image up on screen here so uh, everyone can see it here. Um, it would appear that, let's see, we should have some markings as well. Here we go. All right, let's bring that up. And uh, gentlemen, you let me know if you can see that okay. Yeah, we can see that. 
All right. So what we have down here at the bottom of the screen is the Heber Springs Kingdom Hall, which is a small Kingdom Hall located on North Broadway and Sunny Meadow Road. Right at the corner, they have an extended parking lot right here, but the building itself is uh, just a classic small Kingdom Hall in a uh, small town, uh, you know, middle of Arkansas. But if you uh, take a walk past this uh, little sports complex here, the very next housing complex is the actual residence of Roderick Watkins. So this, this would be a small community where uh, he somehow managed to get a position as sort of a caretaker for uh, this little group of homes. And uh, from doing a little research on this, he's been ejected from that community following his arrest. Uh, you can imagine conservative, you know, middle America doesn't want a pedophile living in their retirement community, particularly since a number of the allegations of abuse occurred right there in his house, which is a block from the Kingdom Hall. I mean, just, just can you imagine, um, you know, he's bringing these kids back after meetings, field service, they all trusted him. And, and I thought it would be worthwhile to bring up an image of, of Mr. Watkins from several years before he moved to Arkansas. And let me know if that image is up on screen. Is that sharing an image? Not yet. You're, okay, so let me, uh, let me do a stop share here and then let's go ahead and bring that back in. And uh, if you can see this image, let me know. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. All right. So um, this is Watkins at a going away party in Indiana prior to his leaving um, for Arkansas. So this would have been around uh, the year 2000, 2001, right before he relocated to Arkansas. And I just want to make, make it clear that the, you know, we've blurred out the faces of the children involved. You know, we're not giving any names. To, to our knowledge, these are not victims of Watkins, but if you can see that in the image, um, he is very clearly uh, holding this young boy. Uh, in an odd you know, way. Yes, it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's not, it's easy to kind of be photographed with children and, you know, we've all, we've all been photographed with children, but that is an odd way to be holding a child who's not your own, isn't it? Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, would, I would never hold a child that way. And um, all the reports that we've received from various states, including Arkansas, indicated that this is the way he was with children. And, um, you know, I, uh, my, anecdotally, from my experience, um, that's exactly the way many of these pedophiles operate, is that they uh, are extremely charismatic. Parents have to be vigilant. They cannot continue to trust these men because they're elders. Th this man is known to be a pillar. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to do this story because everyone that, when I did my research, everyone responded and said, oh my God, I cannot believe this. They said, I was in Bethel with him. Um, this guy, according to one report, he actually lived with one of the governing body helpers years before he's a governing body helper. And this guy is on JW Broadcasting. I'm not going to mention the name right now, but he was very connected to the organization, was in Bethel from the late 80s to early 90s, then got married, moved to Missouri, then Indiana, then ultimately Arkansas. So, you know, we believe that he was, according to all of the reports I've received, extremely well regarded as an elder, was extremely close with children. Um, didn't have any that I'm aware of, a children of his own, but um, he was, you know, you know, had boys nights with the kids, taking the children out. It almost reminded me of just how charismatic Michael Jackson was with uh, children and, you know, very handsy and just bringing them into situations where um, he might be alone with them. And uh, I have to say one of the most egregious things I have, I read that that almost made me throw up was the fact that one of the victim's mothers came forward, and I did mention this in the article, and said that she was experiencing stage four breast cancer and was dying 
and was in multiple hospitals, experiencing multiple treatments for her stage four cancer, had two children, gave those children to Watkins and his wife to care for. And during the time he gave Jeez. those children, they were abused severely. At least the older child was abused by Watkins while the mom lay dying what a time in the to be taking advantage of, of children in that situation just the economy, this is the danger of trust yeah that, that i think that's something that this case another thing really highlights and again this is something we see in cases that involve elders or in other cases i mean the royal commission had an example of this you have a, an individual who's in a considerable position of trust and that means that when the first victims start coming forward, so for example, victim four, uh, Mark, you report in the article how he reports his incident to the elders after the second incident occurred. He was not believed by the elders. He was told that he had perceived the incidents inaccurately, and he said that he and his family were treated differently after this. Now, we know that this is, this is an example. One of the problems that we have in Jehovah's Witnesses, you have a very closed insular community. You have an individual such as an elder who requires it requires a lot of power and influence and trust. So people, that's one of the things the Royal Commission highlighted. But Watchtower tried to downplay, but the Royal Commission, when your own articles admit that people will trust elders with their children, which is what we see here, a classic example of this. But it shows how many more barriers a victim has to go through to come forward, because this isn't just telling someone about a random person grab them on the street or maybe uh, a teacher who's assaulted them, who they know but isn't part of their community. They are having to basically report on somebody who might be the most popular person in the congregation, and maybe the most powerful person in the congregation. And then what happens is the elders say, well, you know, either we don't have enough witnesses or we don't believe you. In this case, he was basically told we don't believe you. And you also know that, that the person, your abuser, is friends with those elders and may have influence over. And that underlines the, the massive additional, um, that two things, it underlines firstly the incredible emotional trauma, extra trauma that victim has to go through. And secondly, it underlines why Watchtower elders are not equipped to deal with investigating this accusation. Not only are they not trained criminal investigators who have no training in interviewing vulnerable um, survivors, but they are, there's almost always a conflict of interest because they are interviewing someone who may have power over them or may have friends over them. Now, in a, in a police force, if there is corruption, the corruption of an individual officer is not investigated by that officer's mates. They have their own internal investigations department. And the whole point of that department is that they're not biased. They don't know these people. They can't be influenced by these people. Um, but Watchtower doesn't seem to recognize that very frequently the people doing the investigation are compromised. They are compromised in terms of their emotions. They are compromised into their relationship with this person. This might be a, an old friend. They, they, might, they might be slightly scared of this person. I mean, let's face it. We've all been in congregations where there are a couple of scary elders and the other elders kind of count out to them. Um, and I think this case is, um, and we see this repeat a number of cases, but I think this, this underlines again in the multiple ways why the only acceptable response from Watchtower is to say, we're calling the police. Because if you don't do that, if, you tr if they try and take it in-house, it opens up all these other fault lines for this thing to go off the rails. Indeed. And Mark, um, before we switch to um, the much-anticipated um, news-reading masterclass that Covert Fade has arranged for us, um, am I right in saying that, well, you, I announced, I, I mentioned at the beginning that there's going to be um, a court hearing in July. That's presumably criminal proceedings. Is there any whiff at all of civil proceedings against Watchtower? Yeah, it's too soon for that. So uh, it's a very good question and thank you for asking. In fact, the uh, attorney for Watkins has filed a, a motion for continuance or extension at least uh, which the court granted, because I think the original trial was scheduled for April. And uh, so basically what they granted was um, a continuance and rescheduled the trial date for July. So let me explain how I understand this is going to work. Um, when you have cases like this with minor victims, so the minors aren't going to be making the decisions for uh, for let's let's put it this way so you have you have four 
in, in this case, you have four victims. Three of them are minors. So the adult can speak for himself, but the parents have to speak for the minors. So they have to come to a conclusion or decision with the uh, prosecuting attorney, with the district attorney, as to what the suggested penalty would be for this man. And if they are all in agreement, then they can uh, settle this. And, and obviously they have to be in agreement with the defense attorney for Watkins as well. So if they decide to offer a plea agreement and let's say send him to jail for 10 years or whatever the number of years the penalty is, then this will all settle without a trial. And that's why they filed the extension to give time to review those options. Whether or not that's gonna happen, we don't know. It could be that the, the remember, um, According to the police documents, the oldest victim is no longer in the organization any, anymore. So he may have one objective, whereas the parents may have a different objective, or, or they may all be in agreement and say, we want to put this guy away for many, many years. And of course, the prosecutor has to do that in accordance with the guidelines of Arkansas law. So there's a lot of moving parts to this. They all have to come to an agreement. If they do not come to an agreement, there will be a trial and it'll take place in July, as I mentioned in the article. In fact, I think the last line is uh, July 17th through 19th, 2019, and that it will be closed to the public. So I wanna mention one more thing, um, and then maybe we can kind of wrap, you know, you were gonna get into the news and some other things, but I wanna mention that the reporting issue is a very critical issue here. And I've mentioned this regarding Maryland and many other states. And I mentioned this, I, I can't emphasize enough, I, I want people to read this part of the article under what's the reporting law. The Arkansas law currently states that clergy or elders must report subjected, uh, suspected maltreatment except to the extent that the clergy member has acquired knowledge of suspected child maltreatment through communications required to be confidential pursuant to the religious discipline of the relevant denomination or faith. So what does that mean? It means that in Arkansas and in many other states, there is a clergy mandated reporting law that says if a clergy member becomes aware of a suspected child abuse, that clergy member must report it to the authorities, except if communications took place which are part of the accepted procedure uh, or accepted communications or private penitential communications of a church. The problem is that Jehovah's Witnesses are saying that all of those communications are clergy penitent privilege. Even though the communications aren't with the penitent or the child abuser, they're with the abuser, they're with the victims, they're with victims' parents, they're having all these communications. On top of that, they're having communications with the legal department, which is call number one. They must call the legal department. So the legal department then says, well, we're not obligated to report. So this came up in the Montana case, and we're going to get into that in a moment with the news, but this is why Watchtower is fighting tooth and nail. The elders are mandated to report, they don't report, and they say, we don't have to report because all of the communication is between the elders the, and the body of elders they consider as one priest, and it's between them, and it's between all of the moving parts, all of the people that were involved in the case from the victim to the perpetrator, and they're saying, we don't have to report, period, because we have the right not to report. Not that they can't report. The law doesn't say you can't report. The law says they must report unless they have this uh, penitential communication excuse. So what I'm saying is that Watchtower is telling the elders to use the loophole whenever they can possibly use the loophole. And that is why we have so many cases, including my own home state of Maryland, that were never, ever reported to the police. It's the loophole. And it's, it's a very dubious provision under law anyway, isn't it? I mean, it, it's certainly not a secular provision. It, it grants religion a whole lot of um, leeway to basically yes. to cover up abuse. I mean, just because a pedophile is 
confessing to the priest, that doesn't mean that, that the priest must stay quiet, that, that this is still a confession that needs to go to the authority. So I've never bought into that. But even if you do grant this concept of uh, being able to confess to a priest and it's staying quiet, it's staying confidential, that in no way describes how this is dealt with by Jehovah's Witnesses, where, as you say, he just gets passed from person to person to person to person and almost, and you can have dozens of people who know about it. Including the abuser. Including the abuser. And the thing is, Lloyd, they can report. There's nothing illegal about them reporting because number one, they are mandated reporters. They don't have mm. to use the loophole. So yes. what is wrong? What would damage the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses if the elders picked up the phone and called the police? It wouldn't. It's not against the biblical standards. It's not against ethical standards. If anything, it's for ethical and the protection of children. It would do everything to better the relationship between the religion and its constituents, its members, if they said to the local elders, look, you're mandated reporters, you must call the police. Whatever happens as a result of the police investigation, you can do your own spiritual investigation, that's fine, but let the authorities handle it because this man is not only endangering Jehovah's Witness children, remember, he's endangering the public. And we saw that in Fessler and in other cases where a Jehovah's Witness attorney or representative will get on the stand and they're asked the question, uh, do you have any responsibility to protect the public? And the answer, such as in the Fessler case was, no, we don't have responsibility to protect the public. And it, it's just sad. And that, that shows how cold, calculated, uh, and, and just how insular that organization is that they wouldn't care to protect the public in the way that they should. So what we'll do is, as, as usual, we'll go around the panel and uh, get some concluding thoughts on this. But before we do that, um, for the first time in person, at least in person on my microphone, <laughs> please do use my Yeti Blue uh, to give viewers a masterclass in how the news should be read. <clears throat> and cue the music. Okay, so um, we're going to start off continuing the discussion actually on the, uh, the Montana lawsuit, which uh, Mark brought up there because Watchtower, I mean, as we've said, Watchtower were basically found guilty. Um, they were fined, I think it was $4 million for the actual damages, but then uh, an additional $30 million for malice. Basically, they, they, the court found they acted with malice toward the victim, and that was where the $30 million came from, from a total of $35 million. Um, the news has come through that Watchtower, as expected, has appealed that verdict. Um, and they have appealed it. They, there's a, I think it's a 20-page document, the appeal, but it basically comes down to... It basically comes down to... A how many of pages? The, 20 pages. All oh, right. Yeah, 20 pages about... Um, how it's not our fault. Oh, okay. We didn't do anything. Up. No, it, it's basically about how um, a lot of it is the man that, that you know, there's trying to use that loophole. Mm. Uh, a lot of it is claimed that the amount they were fined was unfair and unconstitutional and blah, 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 blah. Basically, that's going to go now to um, Mark. Could you correct me? Does that does them filing the appeal automatically mean that the court will hear the appeal? Do we know that yet? Well, the court uh, is the Supreme Court of Montana, and they mm. have already agreed to, to the appeal. Watchtower had a right to appeal, and so Watchtower had a certain period of time in which they could file the appeal. I believe they filed multiple extensions to the very limit where they got it in on the last day because they're researching every possible uh, avenue. In fact, their appeal was so long that they appealed to the court to add 1,500 additional words to their appeal, which ended up being a 69-page appeal. So what happens now that's, is that- That's what I was saying. I'm sure it was more than 20 pages. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 69 pages we're talking about. I have wow. a copy in front of me, yes. It's, uh, it's 69 pages long, and it has a table of contents that, that rivals uh, something you'd find in the Oxford Dictionary. Um, and I mean, I just, we have, we could do an entire episode just on this appeal alone. Um, but what happens now is that the attorneys for the plaintiff, Alexi Nunez, 
has a certain period of time, I think a few months, in order to file their rebuttal to the appeal that was issued by Watchtower. Then what happens is the Supreme Court will review the Watchtower's appeal. They'll review the facts of the case. They will re review the law to see if anything was done inappropriately, laws were broken, et cetera, if the judge did anything wrong. And then they will uh, review uh, the plaintiff's rebuttal uh, to the Watchtower appeal. And then they're gonna make a decision. If the decision goes against Watchtower, uh, then it's very likely that Watchtower is going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And the reason I say that is because they're raising constitutional issues. And the one constitutional issue is the constitutionality of the fine itself, uh, which Watchtower claims is breaking Montana law because they said there's a cap. Whereas Neil Smith and his law firm, the Nix law firm, says that that cap, the Montana cap, is actually unconstitutional itself. So they are making a very strong argument that Montana's cap on punitive damages uh, is unconstitutional. So there's this battle that's gonna take place between the two. And I really don't know what the right answer is. You know, obviously we wanna see Watchtower penalized for what they did that was just horribly wrong uh, and that affected Lexi. But, you know, at the same time, Watchtower is claiming, oh, and there, there was, uh, in fact, uh, item 3D says there, or 3E says there was no evidence of risk to Alexis. Uh, it also says local elders obtain confidential spiritual advice from CCJW and confidential legal advice from Watchtower. So this is more evidence that they're saying this is all confidential. It says the jury lacked sufficient evidence to award punitive damages against Watchtower and CCJW. It says uh, the punitive damage award violates the US Constitution. It, and th here's the one that really just, I spit my coffee out on this one. The defendants are not mandatory reporters. This is actually a claim that Watchtower is making, that the defendants are not mandatory reporters. Why? Because of the loophole. Because yes, they are mandatory reporters, but Watchtower is saying, hey, we've got this confidential communication loophole, and it was all confidential communication between the elders and between Holly and Lexi and between the legal department. And look, it's all our, our religious right to do this and have our internal tribunals and it is a violation of church state separation for Watchtower to interfere with that process. And that is why it could go to the United States Supreme Court if Watchtower. The violation of case. church state separation to have Sharia law, isn't it? Yeah. Really? That's what's the violation. Well, this is the, this is the old, and I think this is why it's going to be fascinating to mm. see the progress of this legally, because essentially what you're having here is a religious court system claiming. Um, that it's above the law, that it doesn't have to. The other thing that strikes me about this is Jeffrey Jackson, the Royal Commission, sat there and said, we want to report to you so much, but unless you make a law telling us to, we can't. So, you know, but in a country where we say, okay, we'll make a law. Well, we'd love to obey, but we just, after much examination, we found this tiny little loophole, mm -hmm. so we're obligated to try and yeah. squeeze through it, even though we don't want to. And it's like, really, who do you think you're fooling? Yeah. You know, you, you, your actions are making it obvious what you really think. So I think it's safe to say that we will be revisiting yeah. the the Montana case once we know more, once the appeal is underway, and uh, I know you'll be on top of that story, Mark. So Absolutely. thank you for yeah, thank you for that. So the next um, the next item, I'm just going to quickly review that um, as you're aware that many um, Russia has basically banned the Jehovah's Witness organization, um, and there's quite a high profile case of. Uh, a Jehovah's Witness called Dennis Christensen, who's been sentenced to six years in prison, um, essentially for, if you read the charge, essentially it's just for being a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and a Russian court on the May 23rd um, denied his appeal and his sentence of six years has been confirmed. Um, just to point out, there are currently 197 Jehovah's Witnesses facing criminal charges in Russia. 28 men uh, and women are among them. This is according to Amnesty International. Uh, 24 under the house arrest. Um, now, obviously, I know this is a, a touchy and controversial subject, but my own personal view is that I, I totally believe that Jehovah's Witnesses who commit crimes should go to prison. Um, I don't believe that being a Jehovah's Witness is a crime. Um, so personally, I find this, I find it upsetting to see someone who, in other circumstances, I think of my elderly parents who, if faced between the choice of 
not being a Jehovah's Witness or going to prison, they would go to prison. Um, and so I, sadly, I, I suspect that amongst this 197 Jehovah's Witnesses, I doubt there are many with any child abusers or people who've committed a crime, they're probably just brainwashed. Um, as I said, we'll keep an eye on it. I know it's, it's a touchy subject amongst the XW community, but I thought it was just um, it was right to update on the latest developments there. Since many Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and of course there are many physically and mentally out Jehovah's Witnesses who may be in Russia who, who might be being affected by this. So, uh, on a slightly more upbeat note, um, I just want to send a huge thank you, well, no, a huge thank you, a huge shout out to uh, an, an XJW author named Amber Scorer. Now, you might have heard of her before because she's actually, um, a few years ago, she published her account of being a special pioneer in China. She basically went to China undercover to try and um, spread the good news. And while she was there, a series of events actually led, led her to waking up. And it was actually trying to push her faith on the Chinese people that woke her up, the, the circumstances she encountered and she left. Um, well, Amber, since then, she's had quite an eventful life since then, including um, tragically the death of one of her, death of her child. Um, and she's written a book that chronicles her life, that chronicles her experiences, also um, how she came to terms with that loss. And she has, her book is coming out, it's called Leaving the Witness. It's coming out on the 4th of June. Um, and she is, you might have also heard her, her um, name because she's just had an op-ed published on the front page of the New York Times, which uh, I believe is one of the biggest newspapers in the world. It's certainly one of the biggest newspapers in America. Um, and she tweeted, you can follow her at, at Amber Scorer on Twitter. And she says, pardon me for a moment, but this escaped Jehovah's Witness from the tundra of Alberta, who was not allowed to go to college never imagined she'd see her writing on the home page of the freaking New York Times. <laughs> Thank you for indulging my moment. So Amber, huge congratulations. Yeah. I, th I think that there's going to be a lot more publicity surrounding Amber uh, without going into too much detail. I've actually had the um, privilege of interviewing her. So viewers, it, it could be that you're watching this Watchtower in Focus after the interview goes up on the channel, but the two videos will be quite close together. Um, but yeah, if you haven't checked out or had an opportunity to check out the interview, please do so. Uh, Amber's just a delightful uh, woman and so inspiring with her story. So I'm really glad that her book is getting the exposure that it deserves. Cool. Um, again, yeah, huge, huge congratulations to Amber. I really look forward to reading. Yeah, that. do we mention the title, Leaving the Witness? Yeah, it's Leaving the Witness. So not leaving the witnesses, it's leaving the witness. I it think is, it's June 4th, it's yeah. going to be released, yeah. You can pick up a copy June 4th. Um, I think it's on, it's on Amazon um, at the moment. You can pre-order it, yeah. yeah. So, um, and I thought the last, the last thing we'd finish with was some, was some interesting JW trivia, because there was an article recently published, and because I'm so well prepared, the uh, web page I had the, the, top, the web page open and is closed. But I'm sure um, Mark can help us with this, because he was involved in the production of it. Have you ever wondered what the tunnels in Bethel look like? I have actually seen a video yeah. of them, yeah. Because we yeah. are, because uh, for your friend of the channel, um, jo Jordan. Jordan, who's yeah. on Twitter, I don't have JW any Rebuttal is his YouTube That's channel. Yeah. Sorry, Jordan, my brain is terrible. Um, his video featured in the article. Um, and also, Mark, you contributed this article as well. But basically, it's a tour of all those vast underground tunnels beneath the Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn Watchtower Complex. Mark, can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, sure, in fact, I uh, might actually be able to pull up a screen share of this here very briefly. Um, that was interesting. In fact, it was our good friend, Amber Scora, that uh, connected me with the journalist. Uh, there were two journalists writing this story, and I was absolutely shocked because I had been researching this myself for the past two years when I discovered that Watchtower had been paying upwards of eighty to $90,000 per year in Brooklyn um, to be able to manage, uh, to the city of New York, by the way, to be able to maintain their underground tunnel network and also their above ground bridge network. So what a lot of people didn't realize is that in New York, when you have all of these buildings in the city, whether it's Brooklyn or Manhattan, et cetera, um, if you build a bridge between one building and another, you don't own that airspace. The city of New York does. and so they charge a sizable fee in upwards of say 10,000, eight to $10,000 per year. And it goes up every year on a scale. 
And the same is true underground because New York doesn't want people just digging tunnels from, you know, the Trump, Trump Tower to the White House. So <laughs> they actually charge a sizable amount of money for the digging of these tunnels. Have you ever been caught now digging a tunnel out of your house, Mark? That's what I want to know. Is it different yeah, in Maryland? It was actually a fantasy of mine back when I was a kid to, to have a tunnel between my house and my JW friend's house so that, you know, I could go down a ramp like a little, you know, <laughs> great escape type tunnel and, and, and sneak out, you know, and run, and, and run the streets with my buddy through the tunnel. Anyway, um, but my I just- My father proposed to my mother in that tunnel. No. <laughs> yes, I'm not making that up. That's wow. a she, she turned him down, and then she went to El Salvador to Special Pioneer, and he flew to El Salvador and asked her again. So it was not romantic to propose to your future wife in a tunnel. So <laughs> your, your, existence, your very existence, Martin, is owed, at least in part, to those tunnels, it would seem. Yeah. She was 18 at the time, and she, she didn't want to get married, you know. How romantic is that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, pro a commissary. I proposed on the top of the Empire State Building, so I was a little bit yeah. higher up there when yeah. we got engaged. Yeah, Mark beats you with altitude then. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know if you gentlemen uh, can see this on screen. Um, yeah. Is that showing up? Yeah, okay, yeah. so this is the Gothamist article. It's, it's quite it's a good read. Uh, is it the Cries of the Pacific, the Cries of the Pacific of Touring Plus? So... <laughs> no, I'm joking. So yeah, uh, just the... Oh yeah, you're looking at the ad here. So <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if this helps here. This is a photo. Is that a little bit bigger? That's great. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. So this is uh, one of my first photo credits in a magazine. I didn't know they were going to use this picture, but it was a picture I took uh, maybe a year or two before I left the organization. And I was uh, spending my last tour of uh, Patterson and Brooklyn. I uh, actually spent a couple of nights in the 97 Sands building, had a chance to take photographs from the top of the 97 Sands over the whole Manhattan, the East River and the Brooklyn and the Manhattan bridges. And uh, I've got a tour from my friend who's now a circuit overseer. But um, so, you know, he took me on one final jaunt because I had done this for 30 some years, but he took me through all the tunnels. And, and this is an interesting picture because it's the, the convergence of uh, between the 97, the 124, the 129, the Towers building. And uh, you can see there's even an ATM machine right there in the middle of that intersection. So the Bethelites could, uh, could get, their, get their cash out. So, and I suppose proposed to their wife there too. Yeah. Uh, but oh. it's an interesting article. Uh, as Covert mentioned, it's, it's just a little bit of trivia. And actually, uh, several other uh, new newspaper articles um, have covered this story. And it just tells a little bit about uh, the communications that took place between Watchtower and city officials. Um, and I've got all the documents on how much money they were spending. And I think that this is one reason they really wanted out of New York. The, the local residents didn't like, I mean, at their peak, they had close to 4,000 swarming Bethelites. And, it, and they wanted to use these tunnels in part to keep the people, the witnesses from being, the, the JWs from swarming the streets because it was a bit of an annoyance, not to mention the fact that the, all of those buildings were off of the tax, the tax rolls for Brooklyn, New York, and they weren't making any tax income from these Watchtower mm -hmm. buildings. So quite an interesting little article. Oh, fascinating. And, and there's one last thing. I'm just going to give you guys some hot off the press. Um, this is from Jan, uh, J.F. Nielsen on Twitter, Jan. Mm -hmm. They're tomorrow in the Faders Landesvenen magazine. Yeah, I've probably just tricked you the whole of Scandinavian. Yeah. I'm going to share a screenshot Apolog for you, Covert. Uh, apologies for the butchered pronunciation yeah. there. Yeah. There's uh, yet another. I mean, the European and Scandinavian media has been doing an amazing job these past year mm -hmm. of running Watchtower-related articles. Well, there's another um, article. They're actually running an article on the Belgian Reclaimed Voices team. And they're speaking with Patrick Hayek and Pascal Martinez. Oh, fantastic. There we go. So that's coming to, well, this is, this is uh, the end of May, so this is coming the beginning of June. Uh, um, by the time this is up, it might already be out there, but they're discussing what's going on in Reclaimed Voices Belgium. So the thing that's really exciting about this is often these media stories stay in their own country. This is the media and different stories are starting to talk to each other. Fantastic. And what we need is a coordinated, joined-up awareness yeah. of this issue. So, Rather than it just being country by country, yeah. we need countries talking to each other and learning about what's going on. So that's fantastic. 
and of course Patrick, a good friend of yours truly, and uh, I'm sure he will have had a lot of interesting things to say about his experience as uh, as an elder. So, yeah, does that, that bring the that brings us to the end of today's news? Well, I, I'm internally weeping at the <laughs> finesse with which that news was introduced. So, thank you, um, Covert. And yeah, when coming back to our story, uh, again, what really hits me about the, these arrests or this arrest in Arkansas is, is how recent it is and how even though Watchtower uh, would, like to, would like us to think that it's on top of child abuse and child safeguarding and is implementing reforms, it wants us to think that we, these are very recent uh, abuse cases that, as far as we can tell, were facilitated to at least some degree by the two witness rule and by an absolute monster of a man being allowed to run amok in a congregation with, without so much as a slap on the wrist, with, with very minimal consequences to what he was doing. So, um, Martin, um, as again, as, as an ex elder who has dealt with cases of abuse and as the father of an abuse victim, uh, what are your thoughts on this story? Well, I was thinking about this. So a few months after we left, it was May of 2016. My wife and I were in a parking lot at the store. We were talking about it. And my wife's like, let's call Zalkin up, the law firm who handled um, uh, Conti's case. We talked to the lawyer, we told him our case, and then we didn't even think about it. The lawyer said, have you called the police? And we're like, well, no. Hang up the phone, call the police. Mm -hmm. Get the legal done first. Don't worry about suing, Get, you know. And I'm like, I didn't even think about it. I said, well, it's too late. It happened 11 years ago. He said, it's not too late. The statute of limitations have not expired. Call the police. So we called the police. Now it took over a year for the investigation and it took another six months for him to get arrested, but he was arrested. But was his punishment suitable for the crime? No. Uh, the, the district attorney said, because that kid, that teenager had molested a kid in the previous congregation. Now my uncle was an elder for over 30 years. He was not removed as an elder because of his son molesting another girl. He was removed as an elder a few months later because he got an argument with a circuit of a seer. So the elder arrangement is a good old boy club. They will protect them. But once you go against a circuit of a seer, another powerful elder, you will be disciplined. So he came to our congregation, he touched my daughter, and then six years later, when I was an elder, he had moved to Delaware and he had molested another girl in Delaware. But the problem was in the first congregation, York Anna, Pennsylvania, uh, those parents never called the police. There was no record. It was just what the elders told me. So they were, the, the district attorney could not use that. In Delaware, those parents did not call the police. So again, nothing could have been done. It was just my daughter's case. So if other people had come forward, he could have got a stronger jail sentence, stronger, uh, more time. Maybe he would have been prevented from touching my daughter or the daughter of the girl in Delaware. So again, it's never too late to call the police. The first step should be, as a parent, protect your child. If it already happened, make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else. And that's my, my final thought on that. So again, this is gonna keep happening and it's gonna keep happening and it's gonna keep happening until the governments in the United States, in the UK, other countries really investigate them. So we have the freedom of religion. We can worship any God in any way we can, but our freedom of religion does not give us the freedom to break any laws or to hurt children. Well said, well said. And I, I would agree that, you know, we need to draw the line when it comes to the safety of, of the most vulnerable. That, that's the most, that's the, the basic requirement of any organization, isn't it? And you've seen firsthand um, the trauma and experienced the trauma indeed of, of what happens when that breaks down. Um, Covert, do you have any concluding thoughts on this story? I think very similar to what Martin articulated, I think this shows us yet again that Watchtower's policies are not fit for purpose. It illustrates why they are not equipped to investigate. Their response should be just to call the police. And as I said, if they want to then have their own spiritual, okay, we're going to sit you down, and we're going to talk about your sin, and we're going to do whatever we need to do religiously to deal with your sin, that's fine, but we're doing that because we've already called the police and they're dealing with the crime. But because that doesn't happen, Watchtower ends up 
essentially trying to deal with the crime. Well, they're not set up to do that. They're not investigators. And frequently, as we've seen, the person who is being investigated might be a powerful, influential elder whom the other elders struggle to tackle. There's a conflict of interest from day one that would not happen if the people doing the investigation were professional law enforcement. Um, and I think this is, again, the same, when the same, what is it they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different outcome. Yeah. So if Watchtower continues to do the same thing again and again, but expects this not to keep happening, that's one of those definitions of insanity. Um, and I think this is why they're not going to change this on their own. This is why we need to see increasing pressure. I mean, all the victims, the survivors speaking up have been so powerful and it's caused so much momentum in the media. And then the media, media pressure on politicians, and we're seeing this happen in the Netherlands, we're seeing this happen in Australia. The, the only way Watchtower is going to change this is from media and political and legal pressure. Um, and again, I think this is ultimately it's down to the, the incredible bravery of the victims who are speaking up and talking about their experiences, which is the bedrock of everything else going forward. Indeed. And it's because of, again, parents uh, taking the initiative in this case. And, and again, I mean, I've no, I, I, I can't say for certain whether the May 2019 article has had any role in this, but if it achieves nothing else, and you know, we've been unequivocal on Watchtime Focus in, in spelling out what the failings are of that article and how in many ways it's, it's simply trying to pull the wool over the eyes of witnesses and using words very cleverly yeah. to disguise what the issues are with the child abuse policy. But one thing that you cannot argue that it does do is mm -hmm. give parents a mandate to go to the authorities. So if that's, what has happened here mm. uh, i think that's that's wonderful um mark do you have any concluding thoughts yeah i was just thinking about what you said there and it, it is a very damaging article but I, I do agree with what you said it's i have very mixed feelings about that um particularly because the article itself implies that everything else is an apostate lie and, yeah. it, and it says we obey the when we're mandated to report to the police we obey they don't this is what they're lying they're using the loophole here in maryland in arkansas in montana in all of these other states and they're saying oh it's clergy privilege we don't have to apply but they can still technically say in their opinion they're obeying the law the jury didn't agree but they're saying we're obeying the law and that's what they're telling witnesses so i i think it's a fraud Yes, I think it's good when parents come forward and ultimately they're coming forward, not at the prompting of elders, but they're coming forward because they're disgusted. They've gotten together. They've said, this is wrong and we're gonna tell the police and that's what needs to happen. So my concluding thoughts are just two things. I'd like to let the victims speak for themselves and the victim that's an adult, I'm just gonna read the short sentence of what he said in his uh, deposition to the police, his statement to the police officer here. This is just the end of it. Um, after he describes everything that happened and then the officer said all of the stories matched, then it says, he said Watkins was one of the main elders and he provided significant resources for the congregation. Victim number four said he, when he turned 18, he stopped going to meetings at the Kingdom Hall because he could not stand to watch as others continued to trust Watkins unconditionally. That's the first point I want people, I want it to sink into people's minds because it is without a doubt one of the most dangerous organizations to be part of when you grow up and are unduly influenced, indoctrinated, and you're taught to trust these men implicitly to the point where if an allegation is made, you don't believe it, or you heard it wrong. And yet this young man had the courage and strength to leave the organization and tell them that he left because it's dangerous. They were trusting this man. The abuse was still going on. They trusted him implicitly and look what happened, at least three other, at least that we know of. So the first thing I wanna say about the reporting is if you know this man, 
If you know anything about him in general, you're welcome to contact JW Survey. But if you know anything about an abuse case, contact your authorities, whether it's in Arkansas, Illinois, North Carolina, New York, contact the authorities immediately and let them know what you know. It doesn't matter. Pick up the phone and call 911 or call Child Protective Services in whichever state you live in or call the Cleburne County, Arkansas Sheriff's Department. Call them. Talk to them. Handle it first. Um, you know, uh, legally, uh, criminally, let the authorities handle it. And then we'll see what happens. You know, the, the civil stuff comes later, but it's most important to do that. Um, so I thought I would raise that issue. And the second thing is that I wanted to let everyone know that, uh, and we're going to be talking about this a lot more, a law passed in New York earlier this year that there is a one year window to justice in New York for victims of child sexual abuse. And that means that if previously the statute of limitations ran out, then they've got a year. It's forget the statute of limitations. It doesn't apply. They can file their case if the defendant is in New York. Now here's the interesting part. You might be in Arkansas, you might be in Missouri, California, and think that doesn't apply to me. That's wrong, it does apply to you. And, and I didn't know this at first, but what is actually going on is the fact that since Watchtower and the Christian congregation are headquartered in New York, they are the defendants in these cases. And as a result, the law, there's several law firms right now that are launching a campaign, campaign to help survivors of abuse to get justice where previously they could not get justice, no matter what state they're in. So no matter who you are, no matter what state you're in, remember that Watchtower is the defendant in these cases, these civil cases. Call immediately. Find one of these law firms. You're probably going to see them pop up on different websites, and you're going to see there's new websites coming out. It's a, you've got a short time, less than a year, where the clock is ticking. If you want justice or you want to help other victims, contact these attorneys. Uh, talk to them. Tell them what you know. Tell them if you've made a police report, give them all the information you have. These are trusted individuals who want to help you and want to get justice. If we don't hold these organizations responsible, then the criminal activity is going to continue uh, unabated. So that's, that's all I've got to say. Please go ahead and read the JW survey article and share it as much as you can, because I think there are other victims in other states. The pedophiles are recidivant pedophiles. They don't just do it in one place. This guy was probably doing it in other states. So sadly, there's probably going to be more victims. So uh, I just want to thank you, Lloyd, for, you know, and Covert and Martin for, uh, you know, shedding light on this and, you know, giving a, giving a voice to these survivors. No, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, what better reason to cut into our holiday than to go over this uh, shocking story, which again, for me personally highlights just how recent these problems are and the fact that these, that abuse victims are accumulating uh, almost certainly as we speak while these policies remain in place. So viewers, uh, well, first of all, thank you to all of you for joining me for this show. Thank you to Martin for taking the day off work to be with us and to Mark as well for your excellent article and to Covert, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you, Lloyd. Thanks for having us. And as always, viewers, don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such episodes of Watch Time in Focus. But for now, thank you so much for watching. Save.